Alrighty, should be live now. Trying a little different stream setup today, um, and hopefully this goes a little more smoothly. So there's a request by one of the viewers um, on an old project of mine regarding uh, DIY electro-permanent magnets. I figured it's uh, kind of worth a revisit. I probably should make this a little louder. Let me just tweak this audio volume here all the way up. There. Cool. So, electro-permanent magnets. Jeez, I'm hearing myself twice here. There we go. Uh, cool. So, electro-permanent magnets. <laughs> Third time's a charm. Um, years ago, I built a bunch of electro-permanent magnets for a stage prop, or I guess a stage effect, and I never did get around to showing what the effect was or what it was for. This is part of the end result of what I had built. Um, effectively this is known as a kabuki drop if you've ever seen a rock concert where they've got a curtain above the stage and they drop the curtain to do this you know epic reveal of the musicians that's called a kabuki drop um, kind of stems from the Japanese kabuki theater um, style where you have a um, I guess theater or acting in shadows uh, behind a translucent curtain so I built this kabuki drop for a particular event kind of as a one-off but it kind of got out of hand just because I wanted to build it as a project um, and kind of go overkill so this is one of uh, five kabuki drop modules that I built yes you can buy them commercially but um, it was a lot cheaper and more accessible for me at the time to just build it myself plus I learned a bunch of things about CNC machining etc um, so I got these housings machined out of aluminum, um, and I'll kind of go through the rest of this later, but what is the heart of this? Well, it is a device that um, basically permits you to hang something, and I'm going to use this scale as an example, and let's just punch up the forward camera there. Cool. So I can hang this... Um, one second... I can hang this uh, object off of the kabuki drop and it'll hold itself passively. This holds about 20 pounds, but um, to give it a good um, contingency factor, I only load it to 10 pounds per point. Um, but it holds it passively when mounted onto a truss using this clamp. Um, and there's a facility to attach a safety cable, but I just took the safety cables off so that I could use it for other projects. Um, but anyways, you mount the curtain or the load on it, and it sits there passively. Once you apply voltage to the connector, this plate drops off, and because of the design of the plate, I'll try and get this so you can see it, there's a hook here. When this hook flops down, it releases the load. So this can sit here passively, unpowered. If the system fails, nothing happens. You actively need to power this circuit and energize it in order to get the uh, the load release hook to actually disengage. So you can kind of see the load release hook there if I get it just right. This is all painted um, uh, eggshell black as well just so that it's uh, I guess less visible up on a truss. So you can see there's the hook and inside this, let me just bring up the overhead again, Um, this is what we have. I'll try and find a not too magnetic tool. Why does it keep trying to bring up that? Okay. All right. So what we have here, we've got two uh, Harting connectors. These are um, industrial connectors that have this hook, and they hook up to a, a connector that. Um, seats in here. They're usually water resistant and some degree of weather resistant. They're reasonably robust but actually not that expensive. Um, this is a four pin. Uh, pin one is always grounded so it uh, bonds to the shell. There's a connector and a uh, shell. So there's the insert, there's a shell and inside each module I have a pass-through from 
one connector to the other. It doesn't matter which way you feed, uh, feed the power. Um, and I'm using all four pins just to minimize voltage drop. I have a pair of um, freewheeling diodes in here to catch the back EMF from this big beefy magnet from being energized and de-energized, just to avoid a big spike of voltage going back to the trigger unit. Um, I have this spring here. I don't know if that's easy to see. I'm going to bring up the forward again. Um, I've got a spring in here, which makes it easy for this plate to get kicked off the, um, the magnet. Let's bring up the overhead again. Cool. Um, so continuing downwards, we have the electro-permanent magnet with the ring magnet epoxied in to a permanent magnet. And then the hinge plate, you've got, uh, I believe it's 60, 61 aluminum. Um, some kind of a mild steel that's magnetic because obviously you can't use an electro-permanent magnet with aluminum. Um, we've got a, I think this is an M6 bolt with a couple of um, nylon bushings here just to minimize the wobble on this plate. Um, when I had this machined, I had it machined with a very loose tolerance, mainly because I didn't want the chance of any rust or any uh, foreign debris from jamming this up. I wanted it to very freely move, but at the same time, by oversizing the hole on this plate, um, this plate would also wobble back and forth a lot. So adding these two bushings means that it has very little wobble, but it's also a very free floating uh, mechanical connection. Uh, regardless of which, that's how the electro permanent magnet was, uh, I guess, integrated into this package. In terms of its holding ability, let's power up this scale. Okay, it's set to zero pounds now. You just put this hook on here and try and demonstrate on camera. I'm just going to pull gently. 16 pounds. Let's see if I can get this with a camera. 12 pounds, 17 pounds, 17, 18, 19, 20. It finally gave it at 20 pounds. Um, so passive hold is like 20 pounds. There's very little force actually holding this hook on here. If I were to put the scale on here and just try and pull horizontally, I can't even get it to register. I think it was like one pound of force about one pound of force and then it gives um, about 20 pounds down here at the hook. So very good mechanical advantage with this kind of design um, and it's pretty elegant and it's pretty foolproof. Um, we practiced the effect for the stage reveal like 10 or 20 times. The hardest part was getting back up on the ladder to put this thing um, back up on, the, put the curtain back up onto this hook. So what was this actually um, controlled by. That's the kind of cooler bit and I guess what I will do is use the picture in picture. I'm going to set this up now. I've got a, a cable off camera so just hook this up. Cue musical interlude. This is that other part of that project that I never got around to um, showing. It's the uh, controller module this was the uh, video, well, this was from the video where I was describing fastening um, a panel or other components into a Pelican case or Pelican style case where you got a polypropylene body, very low surface energy, hard to affix things to. Um, this was the end result of it. Um, so what I'm going to do is hook up my power con. Quick little function test there. So there's a, an arm and disarm key, I suppose. It's just a rotary switch and then two hardened connectors on the output. You arm it and you press that button and then you release. That's it. So let's just get this cable over here and hook you up to here. And I think what I'm gonna do now is go with this camera so you can see the picture in picture. So if I just arm that, you know, stage directors on the microphone, get, you know, you get the uh, cue, kabuki drop, 
three, two, one, go. You press the button. Oh. Wow, demo syndrome. This worked like hundreds of times in testing, and then now when I'm trying to do it live on stream, everything goes pear-shaped. Yeah, there we go. The um, I never did get to polishing off the uh, polishing up the finite state machine for the code running this controller. Um, so I think the workaround was you had to hold it in the arm position, press release in order for it to work properly because you could arm it and then output one doesn't work unless you press and hold. And it was also a compromise if you wanted to press and hold both um, because of some weird race condition. If you just arm and then try and press both, nothing happens. Um, so yeah, I'll just do that again here. Rearming it is as easy as just pushing that back into place and you just arm it and uh, pulse 24 volts onto the line. So, go back to the overhead. Um, one of the reasons why I have two connectors here is just so I can daisy chain uh, unit to unit so I can just run five of them on a truss and suspend an object like a curtain up there. The other reason is so that no matter which side I can bring a cable into, um, it, it just it's easier. Um, of the four pins, I'm doubling them up, so two pins are ground, two pins are 24 volt, and that's just to help with the voltage drop, so you're only drawing power from uh, one of the pins, but the other pin goes all the way to the end of the chain and kind of loops around or something, I think. Um, vaguely, yeah. So, that is it for this really short, quick live stream point of this was just to finally explain what all of this was for. Um, I wish I still had footage around of the curtain drop and I might find it one day and put it up. Um, honestly, life is just too busy to even find stuff like that. Um, I think maybe tomorrow I will do a stream re, uh, recapping this project, the controller itself. Um, I actually had to pull this out of storage to do this video because someone had requested it. Um, so I actually forgot to unpack the remote control unit that plugs into this connector. Um, sufficient to say that this is complete overkill, and I kind of wish I didn't build this connector in. I kind of wish that um, like I had something that was a little bit cleaner, but you know, 50-50 hindsight, if I was to do this again, well, I'd do it a little differently. Um, long story short, tomorrow's live stream. Um, yeah, that's, that's my version of the Kabuki drop. Um, there's a company called Electro Kabuki that does, um, exactly this, and they make a really good product. It's very clean, it's very nice, but it's also ridiculously expensive. I mean, if I just quickly Google, um, Electro Kabuki, and just look at what their pricing is like, I think I built the entire system cheaper than it cost to rent it. Now I guess the other side of it is that the Electric Kabuki system is safety certified, which um, makes a lot of insurers a lot happier. So yeah. Um, one module like this, I guess with more safety features and engineering, costs 274 British pounds, excluding value-added tax. So for 274 pounds, that's over $500 Canadian. I built this entire system of five drop modules. Um, that's pretty blatant. Now, if I was a, a rental house or something, you know, I'd be able to recoup this on like five or 10 shows easily. So, um, yeah, this, this was a no-brainer for a one-off event, and maybe there will come a time where I need to use this Kabuki drop again. It would be really cool if I could. Probably won't, but, you know, we'll see what happens. Never know when I need to do a Mythbuster-style drop rig, and all I need to do is just rig this up on a truss and hang something from here up to uh, 10 to 20 pounds, depending on if there's anyone standing underneath it.
Uh, yeah, so that's it. Until next time, folks, cheers.